Uh, my name is Heather Rank. I'm the uh, team leader for the US Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration's rural team. That's a mouthful. Um, we're here to talk today about investing in rural America. Um, rural America has a lot to offer. It's different than rural parts of other countries and, and a lot of uh, really unique factors. So we have a distinguished panel today to share their experiences. And uh, I will be moderating the panel. So. Um, we'll be doing self-introductions in a little bit, um, so why don't we do that in a moment. Um, just as a, a quick introduction, um, we have additional resources here at the summit on rural exporting or things that pertain to where you choose your investment destination. Um, we have a rural booth over in the US government section. Um, there's also some select USA stats some other booths and state booths and economic development organizations where you can get a lot of on the ground information from different parts of the United States, including rural areas. And we also have some uh, materials on a table outside the room um, afterwards if you'd like to, including a report on the characteristics of foreign direct investment in rural America that was done by the Select USA team last year. So we printed out some of those reports and it is also available in a PDF format. So there's a few of those on the table outside. Um, and so our, and we will also take question and answer at the end of this panel. So if you have any questions you're thinking of, maybe hold those to the end. And we would very much love to have your questions um, toward the end of the panel. Uh, what we hope that you take away from this panel is um, how rural America may have attributes that you hadn't thought of um, to be a, a valid investment destination. Um, and to give you some actual tools to connect with people who can actually help you in rural parts of the US. So why don't we uh, move into introductions mm -hmm. and um, go right on down the line. Sure. Good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Alyssa Levin. Um, I'm actually based here in Washington, DC, where I'm the director of federal government affairs for a company called Avon Grid. Uh, Avon Grid is essentially a large, uh, fairly young electricity company leading the transition to a clean energy future. If you kind of think of us in form of two different businesses, we are a pipes and wires uh, entity, uh, mainly from about New York up to up through Maine. We operate under a bunch of different names. Um, and uh, uh, our renewables business, the other component, is um, mostly wind, some solar across the country. Um, this is utility scale. We've got about, oh, um, 6,700 megawatts of, um, again, mostly wind. We're the third largest uh, generator of, of renewable energy in the country. We've also engaged in a large way in bringing offshore wind to the United States, uh, mostly through our partnership with um, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners to form Vineyard Wind. Um, it will be the first large-scale offshore wind project uh, in the United States, about 14 miles south of Martha's Vineyard. Um, in all, Avant Grid is um, uh, a, a subsidiary, if you will, of, of um, Iberdrola. Iberdrola is a Spanish entity. Um, while while Avant Grid is traded on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, uh, Iberdrola is our 81.5% shareholder. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Heidi Smith, and I'm with the Tennessee Valley Authority. I'm actually in the Economic Development Group. Um, we are a public power company. Um, we serve about 10 million, 10 million residents across all of Tennessee, parts of Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Kentucky, um, Virginia, and North Carolina. Out of that 10 million um, residents, about 85% of our service area is made up of rural communities. So we have a real passion for helping rural communities create jobs and investment in our region. And I'm glad to be here and um, welcome. Good morning, my name is Brigitta, and I'm the executive director of Montana World Trade Center. And for those of you who don't yet know Montana, let me give you a little bit of context. Montana is in the northwestern region of the United States. We are one of the largest states geographically. We border three Canadian provinces, and we are home to some of the most amazing, pristine, natural places on the planet. So there's your proper context for Montana. 
Um, and in a place that has abundant natural resources, you might expect, and you'd be correct, that we have thriving agricultural and extractive industries in our state. You probably know that, but you may not know things like this. Did you know that the state of Montana for four of the last five years has been ranked by the Kauffman Foundation as having the highest levels of startup and entrepreneurial activity on a per capita basis in the nation? Bet you didn't know that. But I'm going to talk with you a little bit more about how that impacts the ROI equation. Thanks. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good morning as well. My name is Jonas Swartal. I'm uh, representing New Colt and I'm responsible for their business development in the USA. Um, New Colt is a logistic service provider focused on the supply chain for frozen and refrigerated food. And what we feel we can do better than anybody else in the world is develop and operate highly automated, hence uh, robotized warehouses. And with that, we, we see that we can uh, offer a more reliable service to our customer at double digits lower cost. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, um, uh, use only 50% of the energy compared to more conventional cold stores. So if you look at the trends around the world in, in the availability of labor that want to work in a 24 seven minus, minus five Fahrenheit environment, this is a good fit. Mm -hmm. And also for companies that are looking to, to make their supply chains more sustainable uh, from a uh, service to their customer perspective and energy use, uh, we also come in play. So what you see is that we work with big food processors uh, who know that we can do uh, this, this trick very well. Um, and we work with them collaborati uh, collaboratively to determine where in their supply chain it makes most sense to develop our business. And today I'm here uh, also based on the invitation of Team Idaho which is uh, considered consisting of people from Burley, from the state, and from Cashier County. And it's an honor to be here, so thank you. We uh, originally had three panelists, and we said we need a more diverse group because it was all women, so then we... <laughs> <laughs> and these are diversity <laughs> panelists. Yeah. And we, I'm from Fargo, North Dakota, and we had a very cold winter, so I guess what I was doing was just setting things outside. Is that count as cold storage? <laughs> that, at that moment, definitely, but probably in summer doesn't. So <laughs> you still need us. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay, um, well, our first topic we're going to discuss is um, what are the things that rural America has to offer? Um, when you think about agriculture or coal mining or oil extraction or logging, um, obviously rural parts of the country have an advantage over urban parts because those are generally done in rural areas. But um, that's common knowledge. So let's, let's discuss how rural America also can be a destination for high-tech um, companies and, and high-tech investments. Is, is that possible? Do you have some examples of how that can work? Um, and let's, let's start out with Brigitte. Right, so I actually think that it's the new normal for knowledge-based industries to be siting outside of major, major metro areas and really finding small, vibrant cities across rural America where they can thrive. And just to give you a couple examples of that, in, in my home state in Montana, um, Oracle has operations in Bozeman, Montana. They employ several hundred people. It's a stone's throw from Yellowstone National Park. Um, in my hometown of Missoula, Montana, if we're talking about FDI examples, uh, UK firm Cognizant just acquired Advanced Technology Group, a cloud cons uh, computing firm in our town. So the reason that these multinational companies are making this decision really, it centers firmly on return on investment. So let me talk to you about a couple areas, the parts of that return on investment equation where I think uh, some small cities in rural America really have a competitive advantage. Uh, we'll drill down on those a little bit. First, turnover or more to the point, lower turnover. Just to frame that a little bit for you, um, I think it was LinkedIn that did a study in 2017 looking across industries at, at turnover. And as you might expect, the tech industry has a very high rate of turnover. I think it was maybe second only to retail trade, something over 13% a year. Even the tech giants like Google, um, they don't typically hold on to their tech employees for more than one year. So think about that. The many, many, many millions of dollars that they spend to onboard talent and you know, to train talent, to keep them on board. So what if you could site in a location where 
you could have people who wanted to stay in that location. What if their single driving factor behind their existence wasn't a six-figure salary, but it was something more like having a short commute to work or being able to go out and hike and bike and play and have work-life balance, right? I know a little something about this because um, I'm not from Montana. I'm from the East Coast of the United States originally. And as a matter of fact, I lived and worked in Washington, DC for a number of years before I escaped the Beltway <laughs> and headed to Montana. And I have never looked back. And I'll tell you that I was an outlier in my generation. But when we're talking about the tech industry and Gen Z right now, this is all about how they make their decisions. So when you're talking about being a tech industry or tech company and where to site, consider that. And the second part that I'll, I'll spend less time on, I promise, there, um, is, is this piece of, if you're citing in rural America, I don't care if you're a five-person firm or you're a 500-person firm, I will guarantee you that you will have an extended, dedicated team that will help you, that wants to get you up and running into the point of profitability as quickly as possible. And yes, of course, I'm talking about economic development professionals. Raise your hand, Montana EDO people. <laughs> yes. But I'm also talking about an extended team. You know, the university system who's there and ready to be agile and work with you and your firm to train the employees that you need today and the employees that you're going to need tomorrow. I'm also talking about accessibility and responsiveness from every level of government. I'll talk about the fact that in, in the state of Montana, I guarantee you that within a year of you establishing operations there, every member of our congressional delegation will know you by your first name. Now just think about how that impacts your ability to achieve your business goals. <laughs> Heidi, I had you um, next. Yeah, Sorry. so um, kind of building on this next gen um, pipeline. So across our service area and rural communities, we're finding some really, really unique ways um, that the communities are getting the younger generation interested in, in the workforce. For example, we have across our service area where many um, industries and educators are joining forces where actually teachers will take time off on their service days, go into a manufacturing operation and actually work and see what, what the job skills are necessary for that, for that young workforce to come into um, play and also getting that young workforce interested in manufacturing and maybe some non-traditional um, industries. We've got some other um, communities across the service region that are doing a lot in writing of resumes, helping sixth and fifth graders interview. Again, just really drilling down on the, on the skills that are going to be necessary to come into the workforce and how they can be a productive in their community. And then kind of touching on the, the point earlier of getting them to stay in that community, wanting them to, to live and work in that community. Um, we're seeing across our region um, many STEM schools, coding schools, coding camps, STEM camps, and we even have one community, I thought this one was really interested, where they actually have fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders that are actually building rockets. And so to build the rocket, you sign up for this camp. The rocket has to get 850 um, feet altitude. It has to fly around for 45 seconds, and it has to carry two eggs in its rocket. So I think that's just a really interesting way to show engineering schools, um, problem solving, math and science. So I think you're, you're seeing that all across rural America. And I think that's really, really exciting. And it's a great opportunity for investment. Great examples. Alyssa, do you have something? <laughs> sure. So we, Avant Grid has, about, has operations in about 24 states, and particularly where we're building the, the large-scale wind farms, as you can imagine, that's largely uh, rural communities. Um, when we look for workers, we're looking for folks who do have perhaps a farm background because it's a transfer 
provide some transferable skills. Veterans, which also provide transferable skills. We um, look for where there are technical and community um, and kind of skills-based classes or schools um, in order to, to provide the background. And then we will provide uh, even on the job um, training as well. Um, these all, prov all help to keep people who want to stay in their rural communities in their rural communities. Um, it keeps them, as, as others have said on the panel, um, close to family, um, allows them to, to um, grow, grow their community, et cetera, and we're happy to be there. Um, I, do, we, I will also say we, um, we're building a very large transmission line um, to bring uh, uh, hydropower from uh, Hydro-Quebec down into New England. Um, we're looking at that project providing around 1,600 jobs um, during the construction phase, largely through rural America. Um, so to the extent that we're able to build up and build the community um, through you know, job opportunities, we want to be able to do that. Um, finally, I'll just add that uh, it alternates kind of almost every other year, but uh, solar technician and wind technician are the two fastest growing jobs in the country hmm. um, and are expected to be so for probably the next 10 years. Hmm. Very interesting. Jonas, any additional points? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the interesting part, of course, about agriculture, for instance, it's a topic with that, that everybody knows for the rural side. But I think in general, throughout the entire value chain of food processing, you see technology playing a larger and larger role. And that enables companies to do things better in a larger scale and more efficient. So I think we should step away from just seeing tech jobs as people who code or make, make chips. Tech is all around us. In every company, you cannot go around technology. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see with our key customer, McCain Foods. They, they invested in the most modern French fry uh, factory expansion in the world, in Burley, Idaho. That's, that's a real rural area. And we built the most modern automated cold storage facility in rural USA. And that's because simply it makes a lot of sense to use technology in our business. Um, what it does at the same time, it generates jobs not, for, not only for people that code, but especially also for people that use technology. And the idea is that people that use technology needs to be a master or a doctor in something is not true. Mm -hmm. It can be everybody. Even people that miss school at some point earlier in their life, but are just really engaged and really smart and have worked on a farm or, or managed a, a shop, those people can, can get the skills to work with technology. And what we have found coming to Burley, Idaho, where there's a tremendous growth going on, we were afraid that we couldn't find the skilled people because there was such low unemployment. And the complete opposite has been true. Mm -hmm. uh, we are an exciting company to work for, people find. And there's a lot of skills that people bring from other uh, parts of the value chain, for instance, farming, for instance, food processing, or just totally unrelated jobs. We have one person that kept the stock control of a, uh, what is it, a redistribution place for used, used products. Um, there's a lot of people with an, a tremendous mentality and skill set to work in our, in our highly automated facilities. And, and I think for that reason, uh, we came there because McCain Foods asked us to come to Burley. But I think if it makes sense for your supply chain to be on the rural side of the USA, don't be afraid that you find the right people because they are there. Several of you touched on um, working with um, educational institutions even down into uh, elementary or middle school. And if you're um, visiting the US, you may not realize that um, the, the model of education we have here is significant local control of education. And local school boards dictate the direction and policy of schools in every single town and school district across the country. So there's a huge amount of variation, but there's a lot of flexibility in that as well. And if, if the, the schools, the elementary and high schools, um, you know, you can actually influence them more than if it were a nationally determined um, curriculum or it's, it's a lot more local um, variation than in other countries in the U.S. And that also goes for post-secondary education as well. We have an enormous tapestry of offerings in um, university at university level where you have private, you have community college and and um, university level and postdoctor, you know, the whole <laughs> scale. And there, too, you have a lot of um, partnerships and a lot of corporations partner with universities for technical training. So there's a lot of flexibility in that system. 
Um, let's move on to another topic, and then um, we'll see how much time is left. <laughs> <laughs> so another topic is, are rural Americans different to work with than urban Americans? Is there a differentiation in um, how people act or how people are as far as if you're, I mean, US is a huge country, and you're trying to figure out the best place to site your location. What should you know about looking at rural uh, places? Is there things to, to consider as far as the people, personalities? Um, I think we were going to start with Heidi on this one. Um, yeah, so we've been fortunate um, recently um, to locate a couple of foreign direct investment in a couple of communities in, in Tennessee, in our region in Tennessee. And it's kind of been um, an overriding theme um, of friendliness and willingness and warmth and really looking outside the box, and I hate to use that phrase because sometimes it seems cl cliche, but looking outside of that box to trying to help that company make the best location decision. Certainly the business case has to be proved, the site, the criteria, that all has to line up, but it's really that willingness of that local community, that friendliness. We have found that um, companies that have invested in rural communities have, have gotten highly engaged on boards, have become great corporate citizens, and really become um, intertwined in the fabric of that community and, and become a, a really strong partner in helping that rural community continue to grow. So we think it's just that friendliness, <coughs> that warmth, and that really, some, sometimes it's that small thing that makes a difference when a company chooses a location. And I think in the rural communities that we serve, we see that repeated over and over, just that willingness and that warmth to really help that company make that best decision for them. Brigitte, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was thinking about the best way to describe this succinctly. Um, I would categorize people in rural America, and particularly in the, the town where I live, as sort of uh, disarmingly authentic <laughs> and very practical and willing to take responsibility for their work and overcome challenges in the, that they may encounter in their work, kind of using a, that tight social network that they've been able to develop living in rural America. It's kind of, it's, it's uh, maybe, it takes a village is the phrase we use here, right? So everybody knows how to roll up their sleeves, and they do. So I, I think that is very characteristic. Um, I think that maybe just looking at a couple different case studies is, is a good idea, too. So um, as you might expect, or as I told you before, Montana has existing FDI, particularly in agricultural processing. And, and um, one good example of that, hi, Jolene, is uh, Nippon acquired pasta Montana in uh, the Golden Triangle area of our state, wheat producing area of our state. Uh, and that happened some years ago. And we were thrilled when that happened. They were thrilled with the quality of the product and the place and the workforce. And I think what really under, you know, underscores their commitment and how pleased they were was the fact that they made additional investment, right? So further capital investment, further job creation in that community um, was proved out. So in more recent years in Montana, what we're seeing is that not only FDI in agricultural and extractive industries, but we're seeing um, FDI placements, an opportunity in more technology-oriented areas. And, and again, that kind of ties back to this um, startup ecosystem that exists and this entrepreneurial spirit that exists in, in Montana. So, you know, we have the highest, well, you might not know. <laughs> we have the highest number of uh, photonics and optics firms in the nation on a per capita basis, right? So this is right outside of, this is, has to do with Montana State University's work. Um, it's Bozeman, Montana. The man that created the first crystal that went into the first laser is <laughs> from Montana. So there are a lot of opportunities for FDI in that vertical. As you may know, photonics and optics, is, it's embedded technologies in many industries. Um, we're also seeing FDI in, and I talked about cloud computing uh, that, that is occurring in our state, and also bioscience. So GlaxoSmithKline has 
this is a major pharma firm, and they have operations just about 45 miles south of the town where I'm located in Missoula, Montana. And the reason that's happening has a lot to do with workforce and this concept of having sticky communities where they can have highly educated, loyal, affordable talent. So that's important. Um, but I could talk until I'm blue in the face about how great it is in rural America. But I thought maybe you'd rather hear it from your colleagues in business and industry. So what we did and what we put out front there are these one-page industry briefs that have information about the industry, but then FDI case studies on the back for you to consider as well. So if you'd like to talk more about that, please let me know. Thanks. Excellent. Jonas, do you have a first-hand uh, experience? Of course. Um, choosing of course. where you were locating and, and how that went. Yes, yes. So again, uh, our decision to, to identify Burley was mainly driven initially by, by McCain Foods mm -hmm. because they had a need for, for a partner in their supply chain. But what was very, um, I said, um, different or a great experience was the way that Team Idaho welcomed us from the first meeting that took place and also helped us to take away very early in the process perceived risks about investment uh, uh, in our big facility in, in Burley, Idaho. Um, knowing that there's a couple of elements which normally are not really in the black and white era of your, of your uh, regulations, for instance, buildings which are not 60 feet high but 140 feet high, and people can think that they block their view, stuff like that, or that we reduce the oxygen in our, in our storage area to prevent fire from existing which is also from a fire prevention side, but it's from an OSHA side, is a point of attention. Sometimes that takes, literally what we're seeing now in France, years hmm. to, to convince local, uh, local regulators that this is actually in line with, with existing regulation. Um, in France, it has delayed a project one and a half years. Over here, two years ago, we had the first meeting with Doug Manning and Team Idaho talking about our project, including the technology. And uh, one week thereafter, uh, they made an assessment saying, don't worry, this will happen. Let us know how we can help you. And that's the reason that this project, the cold store, which was announced as an investment last year, is currently operational and ramping up their business in Burley, Idaho. And I think that this will be a very, very difficult timeline for other, for other projects we will do in the future to beat. Uh, knowing that it's, of course, at the same time, also a 90 million plus investment, so this is not a shed in your backyard, which we have developed in the meantime. <laughs> um, if there's concerns also of people from, hey, rural USA, remote, you don't find suppliers, if you have a cool project, people will come there to yeah. work for you. And there's a lot of local people to, to strengthen the teams which they bring in from, uh, from outside. So don't worry about that. Did you work with a community college? Was there a connection with that? Not yet, oh, but, okay. but we hope that, that our opera system operators, maintenance people, uh, people that work in our facility with our technology will increasingly be coming from those community colleges because that's exactly the right education level. And uh, if I can quote our, our site manager, Derek Betke, he said that uh, in the past when he graduated from an MBA in, uh, in Utah, he had to go to the other side of the USA to find a good job. But, but yeah. by investments like McCain and like Newco, people with good education can stick around locally. And I think that's going to create a, a, a cluster of activities. And, so, and having a pool of labor available to manage that is, uh, is exciting. Melissa. So uh, by and large, what we've found in rural America, particularly when citing our renewable energy projects, is, is a welcoming environment. And I think our, you know, our situation may be slightly unique, but um, what, what farmers, landowners, um, and rural communities have found is that um, when, when we come in, um, we not only bring the jobs, but also landowners are essentially getting a um, cash crop, if you will, um, where, you know, regardless of whether there's flood or where there's drought, if there's a wind turbine um, located on your property, you're receiving a lease payment from, from us. Um, it helps people to, you know, in some cases, keep their family farm in, uh, keep their farm in their family. Um, or, you know, it helps to provide kind of some you know, if you will, some sort of 401k or insurance uh, plan for um, the family. And then if you think beyond the community, in a lot of the communities, communities we're operating in, 
um, we are the largest taxpayer. Um, we, we help um, fund initiatives at the schools, at the libraries, um, fire stations, et cetera, um, through you know, our tax base and also our um, you know, community efforts. Um, so uh, by and large, we do find um, a very welcoming community uh, when we're looking to invest. And I guess you see that through um, our round about 60 projects across the country and round about 4,000 landowners. So to summarize a little bit, um, what might be unique um, in rural areas is uh, if you grow up on a farm or in a rural area, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades. You have to learn a lot of skills and you may be doing building, you may be doing agriculture. Or I grew up on a farm as well. I mean, you're a veterinarian, you're an <laughs> agronomist, you're Mechanic. all these things. And, and it gives people a diverse skill set that may not be on paper, but it gives a lot of creativity and know-how and and kind of can-do attitude mm -hmm. that's very useful uh, for employees to have this kind of attitude and, and background because they can draw on that uh, skill set gained over a lifetime and uh, use it in different ways. And they're also <laughs> creating businesses that might be appropriate targets for you know, vertical integration of supply chain through FDI. Yeah. And, and farmers are some of the most inventive people. They are. A lot of inventions Absolutely. came out of farmers' mm -hmm. <laughs> heads, right? So. Um, Let's uh, tackle another topic here, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Um, so if you're selecting, do you have any tips on site selection? Um, the United States is such a huge country. And even over at the rural booth, we were chatting with someone this morning, where should I go in the United States? Do you have any tips um, or best practices um, advice to help people get a strategy or um, some ideas for things they can do. It's good that seminars at the beginning of the Select USA Summit because there's still a lot of time to explore and meet with people. So do you have any tips? Um, Jonas, do you want to lead off? Um, I would say start first with your own supply chain, understanding it well and thoroughly understanding also what your cost and revenue base is based on. Because those elements that are driving your profitability and driving your supply chain will point you immediately to the places where it's most efficient to be. Uh, and there's, there's likely going to be multiple locations that you then consider. But I would start on that, that, that higher level and then narrow down to compare locations based on the details of your cost proposal. So what we normally do, we don't only look at, for instance, uh, what's the cost of land or which states can give the highest incentives. We look at uh, where is our customer, uh, what's the proximity to that, where is the transport cost the best, uh, where do we find good talent, what are the labor costs, what are the power costs, um, what are unfortunately property taxes. It's a very, if you have a capital rich industry uh, like the, the windmills, property taxes are a big cost driver. And we marry up all those uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, elements in a, in, a, in a model that we built and then we pick a location. But yeah, I would say always start with your own supply chain and your own profit and loss statements to look where yeah, the real drivers of success are. So you developed your own software to kind of analyze locations and choose? I would be lying if I said yes, but this is an Excel spreadsheet. So it's quite, <laughs> quite, <laughs> you may have heard of it. <laughs> an artisan approach to it, but it works. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell our investors. <laughs> this, is, this is not recorded, I hope. Yeah. It is recorded. Oh. <laughs> I do the same thing to do market research to help companies find export markets. So it's, it's yeah. also <coughs> Excel-based. So. Yeah. Hey, keep it simple, right? Exactly. <laughs> Um, let's come down, I guess, this way. Brigitte, do you have any advice on site selection or um, mm. tips? Um, I guess I would say just kind of tying into Jonas's, sorry, Jonas's comments, um, is be honest with yourself about where that business case exists for your firm in the United States and be seeking partners that can help you build for the long term. Um, you know, in the state of Montana, we absolutely, we do have programs that reward companies for job creation and capital investment, but the incentive programs that we offer, and I noticed the incentive session earlier was brimming at the door, they were turning people away. That's, you all know that that's not the primary driver for why you cite. That's just something that can help uh, 
help your numbers be even better if you find the right location. So find those long-term partners that are going to work hard for you. I, again, I just circle back to the people, not only as employees in Montana, but those people that are going to be part of that extended team to help you get your business up and running. We're not jaded in rural America. We understand and appreciate the value of every single job that's created. So look for those good long-term partners in rural America. And then the other thing I would say, although I, ha I must admit, Heather, I have not read the entire report yet that you put out on um, FDI, but I have been uh, done some traveling when I go outside the United States and I visit with the US Commercial Service personnel about Montana, who we are, uh, how we've changed over the years. and. Inevitably, they're surprised because I will tell you that statistics do not bear out the kind of expertise and talent that exists in rural states, including our state. So it's incumbent upon me to be messaging about, well, did you know this and did you know that? And, and present um, business cases for, for FDI in our state. So I guess, yes, look at the numbers, but don't be entirely driven by big numbers. Look for those, those partners that are going to help you achieve and that intellectual capital that's going to help you achieve. Yeah. And, and your two points is, is the per capita thing is very important. Very important. Because All of our stats are per capita in Montana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. When you have a low capita. Yeah. <laughs> yep. OK, Heidi. So even drilling down in that question, so who might those partners be? Um, certainly Select USA has a team that can help you. Local power, uh, power providers, utility companies like TVA um, can help you. Um, but I think sometimes your best advocate and, and your best partner will be that local community or that region that you're working in. They're the ones that live in and work in that area. They can really help you through the process of understanding. But state agencies are very good. Regional partnerships are good. But that local community is the one at the end of the day that's going to really help your company understand what's available, what's not available, how can it work, how can it work, and really work through that problem solving phase with you as you're making a location decision. But the partnerships are out there, and I think everyone mentioned is, is more than willing to be a, a partner and, and, and is equally um, interested in your success. I, I agree with your comments. I would add that when Iberdrola was first looking to come to the United States, what they were looking for was regulatory, regulatory certainty mm -hmm. and stability. And they found that here in the U.S. And you, when you drill down and you look at the various states, same thing, state, state laws, state regulatory certainty, local um, and regional as well. Um, all of that has been critically important to us, um, you know, as we go out and look to siting and, you know, yeah, does a state have um, setback laws or siting laws and restrictions? Um, how could that impact development? All of those issues were important to us, and there um, is likely something specific uh, to that regulatory environment to, to you all who are, who are here in the room. Um, and I guess maybe this is a good opportunity for me also to make a plug for the Senate to pass the pending tax treaties um, uh, that exist between the U.S. and seven countries. Those tax treaties have been pending now for six, at least six years. I've been working on them for six years, so um, waiting to get those across across the, the finish line and, um, you know, uh, hope, hope to get those passed as that would create more regulatory, more certainty for uh, companies that are investing in the U.S. So, thank you. Um, that reminds me of something that I often come across in my export assistance work that seems to be a, a unique thing maybe to the U.S. is uh, because of our stability and rule of law, um, uh, I find that a lot of companies tend to, there's a lot more trust that people are going to be honest <clears throat> and authentic and not everyone's trying to cheat you every minute because our, our legal system protects companies. If, if you are wronged in some way, our legal system will likely be a strong resource for you. So people tend not to rely as much on, I mean, I'm, I mean there's two sides of the coin. I'm, I'm speaking probably more of smaller businesses, but there's a lot of trust in business relationships that I think is predominant in the US. Um, but we do have a lot of lawyers, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. um, it, that uh, sometimes overseas people are expecting a similar 
experience and then they find that maybe not so much. Like there's not that trust. There's not that really reliable legal system that's actually going to you know, help you out in your time of need. So um, it provides a lot of trust that people just have a lot of verbal contracts. And I would say in rural America in particular, uh, there's a huge amount of trust um, that's maybe something unique. Um, True. Anyone disagree or agree? <laughs> we agree. Uh, yes and no, yeah. I think I think in general there's a there's a big legal basis to uh, which which protects companies and people alike. At the same time, neglecting that if you come new to the market would not be the right thing. I would advise everybody who enters the USA to definitely look at the legal side of their business and making sure to involve the right experts, mm -hmm. which often means having local experts involved mm -hmm. on the legal side or the accounting side to advise you how you how you protect your business. And so yes, a lot of trust but also a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trust but verify, who said that? Yes. <laughs> um, let's move into some Q&A. Um, should we use the mics? Should we use the stand-up mics? OK, go ahead. Uh, I'm Craig with uh, Duff and Phelps. And I have a question for the, the state panelists. So Heidi, a couple years ago, you all had a millennial attraction uh, and development strategy mm -hmm. for your rural areas. So how's that going? Fast forward a couple years. and. And uh, how's it happening? How's it sort of developing? Yeah, yeah. So in our service area, again, it's the seven-state region. Um, we developed a young professionals or a young talent cabinet and a group. And so we have um, across our service area about 400 young professionals in that in that on that team. And we do we offer training. Um, they go to seminars constantly encouraging that young professional or that young talent to get engaged and understand um, what the opportunities are for them in their, in their work career. So yes, so we've been really um, passionate about paying attention to that younger generation and also um, in, in exciting our communities to do the same. So making sure that there are outlets for young professionals to get involved. Um, on boards and groups, you know, civically and, and professionally. So yes, it's, it's taken off pretty well and it keeps developing. So it's something that we'll stay, we'll stay involved in. And then we've seen where, in my examples earlier, where communities have taken advantage of even going it down into the schools and in other groups. So a lot of apprenticeship programs, a lot of dual enrollment programs. So it's just, it's really paying attention to where this young generation is going to live and work and hopefully keep them living and working in your community. So thanks for the question. Any uh, additional questions? I have one. You have, okay, we have, okay, Brigitte, yes, what is your question? Yes, I'm gonna go off the board. Um, I wanna know who's in the room in the sense of, uh, are there companies that are most interested in ag relating to rural FDI or technology? So if you have an ag interest, raise your hand. Okay. Technology? I see a few hands there. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> I mean, and obviously, there are many, many other different verticals. But I bet if we would have asked that question even a couple of years ago, I, I think it's always been very heavily weighted to agricultural um, FDI interests. So I'm really glad to see that. All right. Any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> We have wowed them with our information. Yeah, I guess. All right. <laughs> Maybe to add one point then. So if there's any interest to hear our perspective going forward, uh, drop by the booth of uh, Team Idaho, and they, will, they have my contact details. So you can always reach out if, uh, if questions are still there. So you'll be in the Idaho booth. I have a rural booth over in the US government pavilion as well. I'm in booth 535, the Montana team. And we've got people in the room as well. Yep. Anywhere they can find you? No? I'll just be around. around. <laughs> it's everywhere. I have a card. <laughs> I have to run, but I have a card. Um, we also have the few handouts on the back there. And um, there's, I'm sure you've discovered this through the email. There's a matchmaking program through Select USA where you can solicit meetings. So uh, feel free to use that as well. Um, and that's, I think, about covers it. We're right on time. Yeah. Final Thank questions? You. <laughs> Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.